So thank you and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar where we have some very important and uh, honored guests uh, who will be sharing with us. And today we're gonna be talking about SDG1. What is SDG1? Why is it important for trans people? And what can we do around it? What's the type of work that we can do about SDG one. We already know, you know, transgender diverse people are very affected by issues around poverty. And we want to know how this relates and affects the future organizing, but also the human rights and accessibility of services and social uh, benefits for transgender people. In this webinar, we will highlight three factors around SDG1 that contribute to poverty indicators in the trans community globally. Issues around identity documents, gender marker, name change, related bureaucracy, things around education and employment. So thank you once more for joining us. I want to remind you that um, this session is being recorded. It's also gonna be accessible later online. And I also invite you to visit our page, our webpage where you can find uh, all the documents related uh, to the webinar we will be talking about today, but also very important resources that you might find useful in your daily work as an activist and for your organization. And let me introduce, um, our first presenter of the day, uh, Lizel Theron, is a South African human rights activist with an emphasis in LGBTI organizing. Uh, she now, res now resides in Mexico and is, and is a freelance consultant. Lizel's pronouns is she, her. Lizel, please go ahead. Good day and thank you for that um, introduction, Erika. And um, I also want to say welcome to everyone that will look at this streaming. So um, without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen. I prepared a few slides and um, then we can, let me just quickly get that happening for us. Okay, great, there we are. Um, let me just also, I Okay, so um, I will talk uh, again uh, today uh, about SDG1 and the full um, wording of it is about uh, no poverty. And um, I will in the first few slides really go quite fast through them because I have some important information to share with everyone that uh, look at this and will also uh, view it again later. So one of the most important things for us to remember, because we will try to find ways how we can mobilize in our countries and how we can start being more conscious about doing SDG work. So one of the most important things to remember is that the um, Sustainable Development Goals, which is part of the 2030 Agenda, and it has 17 Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them, and those were adopted by all the 193 member states in 2015. That is one of our biggest and most important hooks, how we can make sure that we actually do hold our um, governments accountable because they adopted it. And um, these uh, things here is obviously just to show that, and, and this is the work we know, to improve health and education, to reduce inequality abroad, like every type of inequality and to spur economic growth. That is what needs to be done at a core that goes hand in hand with um, ending poverty. So poverty issues are intersectional. So we need to make sure our work is also intersectional. 
um, all of the different things that contribute to poverty. And it's almost like that chicken and egg, which was first, were you first unemployed or first not have a document or first transgender, all of those things like a chicken and egg literally are interlinked. We almost don't know where it started, but on the other hand, we do know. So um, to the leave no one behind principle, which is part of the 2030 agenda is indeed vital for trans and gender diverse individuals, communities, advocates, everyone that works in this area, <clears throat> because th those um, will be our hook or entry point. Um, trans and gender diverse individuals have been constantly left behind by the policymakers, program design nationally and internationally. If we say program design, again, I speak across, whether it is something the government, you know, a new campaign or a project, whether it is our own human rights or LGBT organizations. If there is not a strong trans presence and voice, it is for sure somehow trans people and gender diverse people will be left behind one way or the other. But with enough knowledge about the SDGs, and how this human rights instrument works, the principle leave no one behind can become one of our largest advocacy tools. And that is why we have this uh, webinar series and also the documents that Erica mentioned that is um, on the uh, guide website. Obviously, we know that with poverty, um, stigmatization, rejection and discrimination go hand in hand with poverty. And again, it's that thing of like what started actually first, because we know how for example, homeless people are more stigmatized, regardless whether they are trans. It, it just duplicates um, or escalates the amount of stigmatization, rejection, discrimination. So um, we did say that we want to link poverty to a few things. And I actually would say, and you will find it better information again in those documents. But at the core of it, I would like to say, um, legal gender recognition sits at the core because and th these are only four examples but we know that almost every facet in life you need your identity document or your passport whatever papers your government issue whether you want to access employment housing and we speak here of housing whether you want to go and find the rent or if you are homeless and need to enter a shelter it doesn't matter what form of housing you need your document the same of healthcare and the same of education. These are only four very obvious, you know, almost like the first ones that came to mind, but we all know across our organizational work and personal experience that basically almost, even if you want to enter the lottery, like almost for anything in life, you need an identity document. So that's sat, sat at the core of everything. So um, most or all activists and organizations actually do engage their daily work, organizational work, around those 17 um, SDG goals. We are just not aware of it. And um, these, again, as I said, I don't want to spend this whole webinar in telling us where to go and look on the website, but literally, if you just put into the Google search engine, um, sustainable development goals, or you put in agenda 2030, everything will reveal to you. Also on the documents that um, we wrote. But, um, I think one of the most important parts of this webinar and discussion is to make sure organizations and advocates know that you don't have to go and change your organizational mission, vision, programs. You actually already do the work. It's really just a case of linking them. For example, SDG 1 is about poverty. SDG um, 3 is about health. And I mean, all of us do something about access housing or education, one way or the other, either our advocacy work, our research work, or our community members that approach us. Those are the topics. So all of the um, SDGs, uh, that's how we call them in short, have a list of targets and a list of indicators. It's very much in the same way how we do funding reports or proposals, you know, where you always have to say what will be your outcomes. And so it is already in the type of language that we in organizational work kind of like know. So we just need to start taking that language of the UN and the language of our own organization and, and bring it together. 
So SDG one is the one that specific deal about the poverty. So, and, and we went ahead and really make it streamlined and easy because I think um, target one, um, uh, SDG one have about five or six targets, but we singled out the most important target that almost all organizations can actually use as an point and also one indicator. But regarding poverty, do not forget that SDG four is the one about education. SDG eight is the one that covers most parts of employment and SDG 11 is where we will find housing. So that is then, um, so if we zoom in and look specific at target one, that is the one that stipulates that basically across all this 193 member states, basically around the world, right? All the countries, should strive by 2030, this is 10 years from now, to have equal rights to economic resources. That's quite broad. So it doesn't matter what your organizational mission and vision is or the programs that you planned or grants that you are pending that you already applied or want to apply for. That is basically almost what we already do. And indicator 1.4.2, specific um, stipulate that the legal recognition uh, um, of documents, because as we said in the beginning, and as we know in our organizational work and experience that really that document is the guide to everything. Another angle to look at the SDGs, and again, I single out in today's topic only SDG 1, um, but if you look at human rights instruments internationally already available, these are entry points that are linked to SDG 1. Um, so you can, depending on what is the level of type of work your organization do, <clears throat> not everyone deals, let's say, with CEDA in the times pre-COVID, uh, not everyone go to New York or go to Geneva. We are all aware of that, but it's good that we start being conscious because we might be allies with organizations in our countries that actually do go and who do engage in that work. And it's nice to make allyship, to make partners, because we know as trans activists over and over how we always have to educate our allies in using the right language. So here's another area. If we are too small in our organizational capacity to go ourselves or to do that work, but have that meetings and to make sure that our partners and allies use the correct language or come to us and ask, how can we make sure trans is also included? <clears throat> then again, we made here a list, firstly, for organizations that already work on an um, international level, that already work with UN issues. These are regarding SDG 1, this type of uh, submissions or documents or um, in international instruments where they can make um, submissions. I'm not gonna read all of this out because the next slide is even more important where I want to really go in, in speaking about organizations that almost, I want to say, think they're not doing already SDG work, but to show to you, you, you actually, it's, it's on your doorstep. You can actually already start doing it. Um, but the last two is very general and almost all of us in our countries, every so often our country come up for a UPR review. And one way or the other, whether it's our organization itself or a consortium of trans or LGBT or human rights organizations in the country, but really that is one of the strongest powerful tools that we can use as the UPR and spotlight reports. Hand in hand with that is not only going and submit to that UPR or to that spotlight report or shadow reports. Also, when your government comes back and whatever they adopted or accepted, hold them accountable. It's one nice thing to make nice promises in Geneva, but what is your government doing when they come back? That is wh why we need this language, that we hold them accountable. And that is where basically all trans organizations and gender diverse organizations um, come in because all of us can do these things on a country level, on a national level to hold our governments accountable. So one of the first things, and it's almost a case of we don't even have to convince organizations. Most organizations, they um, strive or support their community members one way or the other, whether it's through a formal program or by giving support to community members who maybe have a challenge at 
the um, home department or whichever way the government calls the um, department that issue administration documents like passports, like ID books, like uh, uh, whatever it's been called, uh, cards, identity cards. So advocacy with a focus on gender markets, markets. Do it or support it or find allyship, but that is really um, one of the best ways because look at what is all impacted and we know it. Um, expand organizational knowledge. Do research and be on top of what is the issues of your community. This one sounds like, why does it belong here? But when you manage to have that meeting one day with a parliamentarian or with a government official or with whoever, it's great that you know with, on the tip of your hands, your information, that you can really say, this is how our community is affected by poverty. Because remember the easiest kickback or why people want to get back to you is, yeah, well, they must just stop using drugs or stop doing this, you know, all those assumptions that people think that is what is lead to poverty. And no, we have to tell them the real facts. So we need to know, have that answers, be prepared because we will get resistance, right? Okay, then um, we always have to keep in mind and do our work with intersectional lens because poverty and oppression comes with the intersectional lens. The moment a trans person is also a person of color or is also a migrant or also a sex worker or also living with a disability or also indigenous, the poverty escalates. So really those issues, and sometimes it's not only trans and one thing, it can be two or three of those things together. So really, and most of this we know. Um, develop and raise funds for projects in our communities for community members who wants to start a business, support them. Even if you showcase them on your website or whatever, we don't say all our organizations have to all of a sudden do those work, find ways to support them or have workshops that give financial literacy workshops, financial planning. And this is not organizational budgets. We're speaking of how to run a household budget. We need our community members to be more liter uh, financial literate. Then this is a very important one that any organization of almost any size can do is find and identify other organizations in your country that already do SDG work and make alliances with them. Even if they're not in your typical um, LGBT organizational or networking group, if it is a youth organization or if it is an um, organization for whatever other human right, find alliances with them and start empower them with the land which you want them to use. Or even if your organization go yourself to make a submission or go to your national meetings. But if you have allies in the room that you're not the only one standing up and speak about trans issues, but that you have allies across sectors that agree with you and that support your suggestions or your motions you make in a meeting. <clears throat> and here is basically our last slide. So um, familiarize yourself with the 2030 agenda. And as I mentioned before, this is really not to change your organizational mission and vision. Instead, see where your organizational work have overlaps. I can tell you now, there is no organization in the broadest spectrum of human rights that do not do work at least of one of the SDG 17. There are many of them. So just find those ones that speak strongest to your organization and just start using that language. The leave no one behind is literally your golden key. Your justification, how you can hold your government um, accountable. As I mentioned here in the second last point, whether government in your organization's capacity mean only on a municipal level, local level, provincial, it doesn't matter because at every place, our governments will always try to take the easy way out, right? If they don't have to do a lot of work that is a fast stretch to them, they will just slip away, like don't worry, hold them accountable. Upcoming e elections, we always hear of this promises and the month after the election, there is no such a thing as any trans person or if they use the, the, the broader LGBT. And if they use the broader LGBT, hold them accountable, where's the T? 
So really all of these things, but we can only do it if we are aware and um, have knowledge of this SDG language. Include regular discussion points on organizational level and use all your types of tools, your IGM, your organizational newsletter, your website, your strategic plan. Inform everyone how your mission and your vision and how your projects link to whichever of those SDGs you um, selected. The reason is when you at that moment then, let's say as small and more personal as municipal level, if you finally reach to that meeting or that politician that uh, campaigned for elections, then your whole community know the language. It, it is so much more difficult for them to slip away because everyone is aware of we, we have our eyes on you. So that then is me. And I want to say thank you and not take up too much more um, time. I'm not sure if guys will make the, uh, the um, PowerPoints also available, but I can be found at my email address and on my website. Otherwise, contact Erica or the guide team. So I will stop share my screen now. And um, thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Liesl, for that uh, very compact uh, presentation with a lot of information. Um, uh, thank you for uh, the viewers that have joined us for the webinar. And if you have any questions that you would like to propose, you can do so in the question and answer button. I already see some questions popping up. We will address them live. Um, but first, I want to introduce our speakers that we have today, who will be speaking about their experiences about dealing with poverty in their countries. <clears throat> we have a speaker who we will not have the video on. We will refer to the speaker as Anonymous uh, for safety reasons. Anonymous is a transgender activist from the Asia Pacific regions with pronouns he, him. With us, we also have Alexis DiMarco. Um, Alexis is a Caribbean trans activist, human rights activist. Um, she is the executive director of UCTRANS United Caribbean Trans Network, uh, pronouns she and her. And finally, we have Ms. Dina Riquette Bonds, who is the co-chair of Trans United Europe and director of the Transgender Clinic in Amsterdam, pronouns she, her. So I'm gonna go first to, to our speakers and ask what same question for all of you. Share your experiences of dealing with poverty in the trans community. What experiences have you had in your community, in your countries, in your region about dealing with poverty among trans people? Um, Dina, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, one of the things is I can also start with my own, what I've lived as experience. I think when I came out and um, changed uh, my life and my identity, immediately I dropped out of the working um, environment and I was a, a lawyer and I worked as um, a corporate. So it meant, meant that I came in, in welfare from uh, like in, within uh, less than a year. And I could never come back to my normal occupation. So it means that your normal income and your normal lifestyle that you've had um, was gone. And then all of a sudden you had to do it with um, institutions that, that tell you what to do and uh, where to go. So for example, in my case, I had to, to be re-educated uh, as a nurse, and then I had to work in a hospital. Um, it's not totally bad. And I mean, it's not that I had no income, but I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big drop for my personal life. It was a very big change. So I really was looking around me, like all those people that I knew who were um, not having the same privilege as I had, like coming from a real good job and ha having the ability to, uh, to re-educate uh, by, the, by the government. And those were actually all my friends, all the people that I knew for, for a long time ago, for a long time already, um, mainly the migrant people here in Europe, uh, people from a colonial background, and I am myself as well. And, um, and then I sort of started to, to see patterns, right? So when people have no access to, uh, to jobs, um, there is something within that system. And what I saw is that a lot of people were either bullied out of their job, which also happened to me many times, even in the hospital, 
um, and then you're back to zero. Um, but also what happened is, of course, people are um, trying to get a, a job and are doing really their best to, to do all these procedures and, and le writing letters and time and time again, people are, are rejected. So there is something with the, with the trans identity here in Europe and uh, especially what I saw here as well in Amsterdam, uh, where people just don't get the job. And then we made this conclusion, like, where do we see actually our people? Uh, do we see them at the government? Do we see them in the, in the city hall? Um, do we see them in, in offices? And actually they were nowhere to find. Just very, very lucky people who have a job, but randomly and, and like uh, if you want to say it in percent such like maybe 80 percent 70 percent is unemployed and even in a in a western european hemisphere and in amsterdam as, a, as one of the capitals that claims to be so very progressive um so we brought this to the municipality actually with um with a plan and also it, it it's also a process where you help people accountable for what society does for injustice uh, and for repairs. So if, if we come from a background of people who are coming to Europe because our parents were part of the colonies that are no longer colonies, but we have the rights to be in the Netherlands and we cannot access jobs, uh, there is something totally wrong. And I think that is a movement that is larger. So I've already heard Liesel speaking about intersectional and being with more than, than only the trans community. We are working very close with uh, Black Lives Matter in the Netherlands with uh, kick out Swart Piet, which is a, 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 um, a group that is focused on um, black facing, a black beat. Uh, it, it, it's a traditional, but we really are next to those anti-racist um, movements and part of it. So it means that, that we are seen as trans people of color and that we take our space. Whenever there's something to be organized, we are part of that movement. And that is one of the most, I think, more, most important signals to society. To, that there is something to be changed and it has to be done with us included. Thank you very much, Dina. Uh, and thank you for the amazing work you're doing even, you know, particularly from populations and community groups that many times in, um, you know, are not that prominent and well discussed when it comes to certain parts of the world, including Western Europe. So uh, thank you for sharing. I want to remind people, you can put your questions in, in the Q&A uh, chat and we will be answering them. Anonymous, tell us about your experience of dealing with poverty in the trans community in your region, in your country. Thanks, Erica. Well, the COVID-19 is a pandemic that's changing the landscape that we live in. Asia Pacific, like many other regions across the world, is witnessing an unprecedented health emergency and has exposed an alarming gaps and challenges in the system when it comes to the welfare and rights of trans and gender diverse people. Well, the rollout, I mean, of COVID-19 measures and the realization of imminent massive economic shocks have brought uncertainty and a range of challenges that are being felt and has amplified societal gaps, growing threats, stigma and discrimination towards our community. Concerns are mounting for our ability to access food, shelter, healthcare, and other basic necessities. Now, the 2030 Agenda is the blueprint and a universal call to action to address the global challenges faced by the people. But the agenda itself was drafted without any explicit reference to suggest. I mean, big expressions such as other status and all have, okay, fortunately created an entry point for the inclusion of marginalized communities, not explicitly written in the document, but it has also to our community's disadvantage been interpreted by, this, by some government as allowing the exclusion of trans and gender diverse people. Um, you know, during the lockdown, we have seen some trans and gender diverse students had to stop studying because they were kicked out of their house by their family. Some have lost their means of income. As most transgender people earn income through 
informal sector or irregular work. And they are now facing a particular risk of long lasting financial impact of the lockdown. Some are now homeless and without any income. Recently, the Asia Pacific Transgender Network highlight, uh, in their Trans Resilience Report highlighted that 88%, which is equivalent to 2,359 of recipients of the COVID-19 Community Support Fund reported a loss of income, reduced income, or were forced to go on unpaid leave. Um, the way I see it, I think, um, historical, systemic, and systematic discrimination against trans people stemming directly from harmful laws of criminalizing our identities and a lack of legal gender recognition across Asia and the Pacific region has further impacted trans people access to financial and health security throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Many fear to apply for government COVID-19 response benefit the fear of giving their legal information and facing the repercussion that may come with it. In India, Indonesia, Philippines, Nepal, Sri Lanka, it is reported that many in the trans community were excluded from social protection schemes aimed at enhancing hardship during COVID-19 due to their gender identity. Given that many are unable to change the national documents to reflect the gender identity, the linking of social protection schemes through national identification documents meant that many trans people were not able to produce authenticated documents, could not access government support and relief efforts. Well, despite the turbulence that has been caused by the pandemic, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. I saw how spirited our community was in supporting one another, how strong we were in standing up together to help not only our community, but in reaching out to those unreachable. I saw how selfless we all are in ensuring that during this pandemic, we leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anonymous. In, in this last part of what you were sharing, you mentioned that you have had an experience in seeing how selfless the community can be to reach out even to those who are supposedly unreachable. Um, are you able to share a little bit more of that experience? And when you say to reach beyond, who all was reached by the community? No, from where I come from, our center provide provisions and food to the cisgender person, the, those who are not privileged, those who during normal times would have discriminated us, but we which we provide, we give to them because we know that during this time, everybody needs that little help that we can. So just standing there and looking at our community, giving out that help was remarkable. You know, we, for me, the way I see it, we stood above it all. Despite us being discriminated, we stand tall. And thank you very much, Anonymous. And that is very commendable, you know, to know that we can rise beyond even serving and providing for those who discriminate against us. So I really, really want to thank you for your work and your courage. Thank you, thank you for that. And you know, we're gonna move now to the Caribbean. Uh, I miss the warmth of the Caribbean. Uh, but let's hear uh, from Alexis, you know, how has the experience of trans people dealing with poverty been in a region that is so neglected in many aspects? Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Caribbean region and the opportunity to provide some um, realities on the ground for our trans communities. And I think that's important in our conversation, our community that we serve, their realities. As we know, the Caribbean region has already been living below the poverty line as many countries. However, the poverty line in the Caribbean, such as basic access to food, basic access to shelter, basic access to having money to buy the 
daily needs of life, such as the deodorant, such as the toothbrush, such as the toothpaste, to be able to take care of yourself. So we see here the Caribbean was already, many of our trans communities didn't even have these basic necessities or these basic needs. And some of them still don't have these basic needs. With the impact of COVID-19, we see they even it's even more layers that's been unveiled of the trans communities not having access to identity documents to go into a COVID-19 test, to be able to access state um, agencies in order to survive during this period of COVID-19. So for, for us living in poverty comes with a whole cycle and it starts at the cycle of displacement. When the family throws that individual out, that trans individual out, they start at the poverty line from childhood and from a very, very young age, this poverty affects them. They have to be able to defend for a place to live, a place to access food, a place to access water. These basic SDG needs that we're talking about here at a very young age in the Caribbean, trans communities begin this level and this cycle of poverty. And what we're trying to do now is we're trying, like um, Dana said, collaboration. Collaboration is very important when it comes to eradicating poverty. And this collaboration comes with the effort of understanding and sensitizing decision makers and gatekeepers on our trans community, on our communities that are left behind. Because in the politics, in the politics world and in the politics arena, there's still some disconnection on the realities of individuals, on the realities of citizens living within our countries. So what we need to do is we need to actually bring the voices of our community, bring the voices of our citizens, bring the stories and the realities of our citizens to our decision makers and actually show them, hey, these are the groups of persons that are left behind when it comes to poverty. Poverty is not just affecting one group of people, Poverty is affecting many groups of people. And I think us collaborating with the many groups of people that poverty affects, especially within the Caribbean region, and bringing this information to our decision makers and to our gatekeepers is a way forward. We do see again through COVID-19, we were able to buy, we were able to provide food support for our trans communities. And in those trans communities, they were able to help their families who have left their jobs. As we know, the Caribbean is a tourist industry and most of the persons work within that tourism sector. And because of COVID-19 and the impact of it, many of them haven't worked over eight months because of the tourist um, sector being closed, hotels being closed. So these trans persons who live in their families, as an organization, we were able to provide that support to the trans individuals who was then able to provide that support to the family that they're living in. So that was a good collaboration, a, a good start to building bridges and building gaps, bridging gaps with communities for us to be able to connect to our families again. Because we know from a very young age, trans people are disenfranchised from their family, they're put out. So that was one of the ways of building those bridges. Even if those trans individuals did not live at home, they were still able to take a piece of bread, to take some rice, to take some milk to that family. So poverty affects us all. And I want to say that it takes a collaborative effort for us to eradicate it. But again, we must hold our decision makers and our gatekeepers accountable as it relates to the 2030 agenda and as it relates to eradicating poverty. Thank you very much, Alexis. And Liesl, Anonymous, Alexis, and Dina, uh, I'm going to start uh, uh, conveying the questions that we have. Any of you, please, please feel free to answer them. But, you know, you everybody has mentioned collaboration to some extent, collaboration to address poverty, collaboration to provide services, collaboration to work on SDGs. And there is a related question about it. It's, can, can you all clarify the best practices, examples, or strategies, and on how to build those alliances, um, how to build those collaborations, what has been the biggest challenges or barriers that we should be aware of? I'd like to start to talk about some of the barriers and some of the barriers, just one moment, let me plug in. The, some of the barriers include um, 
state agencies. State agencies can be barriers for our communities. And when I talk about state agencies, I talk about like the Department of Social Services, the Department of Gender and Family Affairs, who don't recognize that these communities exist. However, they do recognize that the citizen exists. So the entry point for us was coming as a Bahamian citizen or coming as a Caribbean citizen and being able to say, hey, I am a Bahamian. I have a right to these needs. I have a right to accessing the food that you're offering to all of our community members. Signing our community members up if they have difficulties using their identification. We also can see that's a barrier for our community coming forward because the identity does not match what is in front of them. And I think this is where the importance of gender identity recognition and moving in the Caribbean as it relates to those gender markers and those non-binary markers for people are important because what, it ha what happens in that it leaves it leaves pure persons behind. And if we're talking about leaving no one behind, these are the types of conversations that we need to have. And in collaboration, it takes working with your allies, finding your allies, and that's what we had to do. Finding our allies that work with these state agencies, that work with the Department of Gender and Family Affairs, that works with the Department of Social Services, and to be able to have them voice our concerns and bring us to the table. And that's where we found the common ground and the collaboration within our country. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to add something? I can also say something. Go ahead. Um, obviously, my point will be from a different direction. I'm not um, hands on in direct activism, but obviously our work continue being activism. The one question that asks, how do we best find allyships in our countries, for example? And um, that was a point made in my slides. And it takes me back to my um, activism years when it was directly linked to an organization. Those things don't happen overnight. It really is relationship building. I am very, very strongly saying, feeling and, and of the opinion that we have to break out of our silos that we work in and work intersectional. But it doesn't happen overnight. We cannot expect uh, NGO or organization or advocate that works on, let's say, children's rights issues or on human trafficking or on any other topic that we want to link. We can't expect them to just incorporate the fully accepted, perfectly um, worded and understandable trans and gender diverse language into their documents. We also have to recuperate. If they have, again, a panel session on whatever children issues, offer and say, I will be one of your panelists. I will also play part in whatever your work is doing. It's really like relationships in life. Like it has to be both ways. We cannot expect them to immediately understand our issues and, uh, I, and I remember from my first, first, first transgender activism years in, back in 2005, there's also a whole thing that goes about allyship because for example, I'm cisgender. I had to take time to make um, it very clear that my um, allyship is genuine, that I'm not in there for something else. It really takes years. It took me about my first I would say six years of activism before I was internationally across the board trusted as I'm, a, I'm an ally. It don't come overnight. So the same will happen in your own country. Don't expect them to just immediately take on board things. Thank you very much, Lethal. And I do realize that we have several questions and we have some limited time. So, um, but I do want to, to make sure that we go over all of them. So everybody just please feel free to jump in to answer any of the questions, but also let's keep it short and compact. So, you know, we're talking about SDGs, there's objectives, all these countries have signed to it. What can be done when a member state works against the SDGs? Who do we tell? Who do we complain? What's the process? Any ideas? here yeah i would say um the respectable or respective uh, member states um 
would be um, they have delegates. You, st you can start to have uh, lobby uh, sessions or trying to reach out to those people. Um, what also helps is that there are uh, within the trans community at several levels, also with GATE, but also uh, in your own country, there are people working on, um, um, let's say, policy and advocacy lines with uh, politicians. That is also very important to start to have um, the evidence-based uh, thing. So, so if there is discrimination upon someone's identity and it is, it's a, you can make a case of, out of it, there's something to prove. It's really good to, to start sometimes even strategic litigation. That's, that's one of the things where you can start to show the country that it's not um, following um, human rights um, protocols. That is one of, it's like the calling out, but, but the, the, the thing that starts, I think would say, would be try to, in your own country, try to find uh, the networks that can do the legal work, but also that can do the, the, the political influence work. There are always parties uh, that are at our side, so to say, so to speak. And I think it's very important to have them in your, um, in your work and to, to, be, to be able to reach out to them. Uh, as soon there's something really important that you can channel up with them and have have their um, have their opinion and to start to have discussions, I would suggest. Yeah, thank you very much, Dina. And of course, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, and various resources, um, uh, you know, reports that can be submitted and and opinions uh, to be submitted. You, uh, organizations, movements also engage in producing shadow reports. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities, but I wonder, Anonymous, would you have something to add on regards what people and activists can do when a member state is completely going against the SDGs? Thank you, Erica. I was just gonna add to that. I think that sometimes when, it, when push comes to shove, and it's left up to you to stand up for your community. And when, when, it, when it comes to SDG, do the spotlight report, you know, um, find out when your country's VNR is coming up. You have all the research information that you can compile and put it all in the report and just submit it. Because sometimes, yes, we need to take things in our own, own hands, have the report for our community, put it out there, and maybe, maybe the country will take notice, the agencies will take notice, maybe. But it's better something than nothing. Thanks, Erica. Thank you very much. And that's very important to note because as this kind of changes can sometimes be very slow. And you know, when we are directly affected, when it affects our lives, when it affects our direct survival, I think we would like things to happen so fast. And the reality is that, especially in the UN system, th things move slow. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy, to, a lot of collaboration, partnerships that need to be formed. So thank you for sharing. Uh, um, I'm not sure if all the panelists can read the comments that have been shared. There's a, some comments about situation in Sweden and also the requirement for psychiatric evaluation uh, for uh, legal gender recognition. And this is really important when we're sharing how things are in different countries. So I want to take the opportunity for you, Alexis, Dina and um, anonymous to please share with us what is the situation around legal gender recognition in your countries we have seen a, 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 a viewer share with us that you know it has to go uh, through a psychiatric evaluation and then it has to be a long wait also when your legal gender is googable and public it, that's the case in sweden how is it in your countries alexis let's start with you well, for the Caribbean region, we are just actually starting to map, and this is very important, map how many trans and gender diverse persons do we have in the country. And I think this is important, especially when you're going to talk about gender identity recognition and gender identity um, identities to state officials, to decision makers, and to gatekeepers. We need to understand, and in the Caribbean context, they need to understand who are these trans citizens? 
where are these trans citizens located in the Caribbean? So we can be able to begin to speak with this one voice and this one voice of advocacy as it relates to gender identity recognition. So in the Caribbean country, we do have where you can change your name to any name that you want. It has to go through a deed poll. It's for any citizen of the country. That's their right as a citizen to be able to change their, their name. However, that's a cost. And we're talking about poverty. So for some trans and gender diverse persons, they can't fulfill that cost of completing that first step of affirming their name. They might want a name to affirm who they are. That's the first step when it comes to the Caribbean region and barriers not being able to afford that to change the name. The second part is the gender markers. We now have, we're now mapping and researching what are these barriers? And some of the barriers are the birth certificate because the birth certificate can't be altered, can't be changed. The other is the passport. The passport in the Caribbean region is used as an official document. Whereas we need to change that to be used just as a document for travel and not an official document. We need to start creating a document or an identification that you want to be used for an official document. And on that, we want to lobby for the fact that we can now include the gender markers for um, trans persons and not for trans persons who have medically transitioned because what they're trying to say is we want to use medically transitioned and as the um, person asked, um, the fights that they're having, having to see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, just to identify your identity is pure extreme violence. And it's a human rights violation to the individual. So what we're doing now is we're using some advocacy tools and we're pushing information out to our decision makers and our gatekeepers as we move forward in the Caribbean to recognize and to address gender identity recognition. So these are some of the steps that we're taking. We are left behind when it comes to gender identity recognition, but we're now pulling up our socks as a community and as Caribbean people to help our decision makers and our gatekeepers heard that this is what we need as citizens of our country. Thank you very much, Alexis. And you know, uh, uh, Dina, you know, I come from the Caribbean regions, the same region Alexa comes from, and it's that same reality. And you know, many times in our region, we have this notion that Europe is a paradise, particularly Western Europe. You know, and I, I, when I came uh, to reside in the Netherlands, I was confronted with the harsh reality of everything that is going on. And it's not as easy as the, some parts of the world seem to think uh, for trans people, you know? It does has uh, some advantages and there's some differences, but that just shows the disparities that the world has when it comes to enjoying the human rights of every individual. But tell us, Dina, what's the case in the Netherlands? Yeah, well, the Netherlands, we just came out of um, a law case actually against the government. I was part of that. Uh, we, we started a trans collective to show the injustice of uh, sterilization that was first um, mandatory to get a, a, a change uh, in your documents. So holding the government accountable uh, in, in a law case is pretty well. That's the situation in the Netherlands, at least. You know, there is at the moment, there is for everybody the possibility to change uh, documents. Uh, but there is still a heritage of, of long time injustice. Um, that's that's starting to be repaired, but it says something about where we come from. Um, it's something about the situation of trans people without having any legal uh, possibilities to to be part of the system. At least, you know, you couldn't work, um, and work in itself is, of course, for trans people something, uh, especially as well here in Europe, which is well, I already said it's pretty difficult and challenging. On the other hand, we can do uh, work. Um, such as sex work, which which by organization is part of the sex worker uh, community. And we say that for uh, the, the same level of legislation and, and uh, let's say possibilities for uh, cis sex workers, uh, if you're trans, it's, it's, it doesn't even equal somewhere, you know? There is just no possibility if to work uh, in a club or in a, in a, in a, in a window, if you're, um, um, uh, gender uh, gender is not marker is not changed 
So it means that people who come from abroad, from the Caribbean or anywhere else, and it's not possible to change their documents, uh, it means that they, they, they will be not able to work legally, nowhere. And I think that is one of the things that people often forget. It looks very rosy and it's all arranged in Europe. Um, we also see a very large back, um, backlash, uh, which, which, for example, in Poland and Hungary is really to be seen. So I think that, that the, the level of um, um, privileges that we have in Europe, it's, it's, it's not all that fantastic. And, and especially not if you are coming as a migrant inside Europe, then you do have absolutely no um, or very difficult access to all those uh, fantastic uh, laws and, and things that have been arranged for the community. So that's Thank a good situation, yeah. Thank you very much, Dina, and, and thank you for sharing uh, this. Um, Anonymous, really quickly, what's the situation on regards to legal gender recognition in um, your region? Uh, okay, this is going to be very quick. Um, some parts of the region, yes, it's going fantastic. But where I'm coming from, there is no such thing as legal gender recognition. We are still um, challenging the court on the cross-dressing act, what more we are talking about legal gender recognition. We are way, way, way behind than most of our sisters and brothers in other countries. And that's that area fast. Thank you very much. That was really fast. And I really, really want to thank everyone that joined us today. This will be recorded. You can then access it again and, and you know, other viewers can access it. Um, uh, and you can find uh, the resources that we have talked about today in the web page uh, that he has been shared in the chat. But before we go that, before we go and end the webinar, we would like to get a little bit of feedback from you. And I'm gonna leave you with Navon, um, the heads of communication from Gate for this part. Navon. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, so I'm just going to, I've just put into the chat box um, a link, you can just go to the link to vote, and let me just quickly share my screen. Um, it's just a four question survey, so it shouldn't take too long for us to get through it. Um, so you can see it on the screen there, so you can either go to menti.com and use the code, or you can just click directly on the link. Um, and I will, I'll give it maybe 30 seconds on the countdown. Um, and then we will move on to the next slide. And this just gives us an idea of who's attending our webinars and, um, you know, what, uh, what region we might want to focus on in future webinars and so on. Um, so it provides us valuable information to make sure that we're doing the right, right kind of, um, you know, relevant webinars and work for people. Okay, great. Uh, so we will go to the next slide. Um, so the question here is, did you learn something new today? Um, it's quite a simple little survey there. No, 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 too, not, not, nothing too complicated about it. Um, so just do another quick countdown. I hope people can use this um, this little voting thing. It's a, a first time using Mentimeter, so we're hoping that it works well um, in order for us to get some feedback. I've got two seconds. Okay, and then so the the third and second last slide. Um, it says, uh, God, I can't see my own writing. Yeah, how relevant was this virtual event to your work? Um, so, and from on the left hand side is uh, the disagree, on the right is the agree, and they've got very relevant, somewhat relevant, or not relevant at all. I'll stick a quick countdown timer on it. And again, this just gives us an idea of what, you know, what people are kind of looking for from our webinars, you know, are we covering the right topics? Um, 
and the next the next um, slide will give you an opportunity to feedback. So if if it wasn't relevant to your work, please do um, give us some suggestions on what would be relevant. You know, so that we make sure that we are um, you know covering the right sort of topics for people. Okay, great. And so on to the final slide, um, which is what are the topics would you like Gate to discuss at virtual events? Um, and you, you can do multiple submissions to this. So you can write a couple of different suggestions as you wish. Okay, so we've got health. Actually, we have a health one tomorrow. Um, so if you manage to register via our website for this one, at the same time tomorrow, we're having one on the SDG3 um, on health and well-being. So perhaps that um, will be of interest. Um, I've got to put the countdown on. Give her another 30 seconds. And please, you know, feel free to give any and all suggestions that you think um, is uh, relevant to your work. This really does help us to make sure that we provide the right kind of, um, you know, resources for our communities. Okay, so turf. Actually, yesterday we had a webinar on the um, anti-gender movement, which is essentially the turf movement. Um, I will be putting that um, on our YouTube channel and on our. I'm just going to allow that go for another thirty seconds, just in case there's any extra. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we, so, so I'll be uh, putting that recording up, um, and um, we're also. Um, oh, sorry, I had to reload that. There you go. Um, yeah, so that recording will be up, and hopefully that's to cover some questions around tariffs, uh, human rights, trans health, trans housing, marginalized community, anti-racism, sex work, and HIV gender affirming care in Sweden, I believe RF RFSL does some of that work, SDG4 education, concrete success stories, DPAS. Um, again, that was, was sort of covered in the anti-gender one yesterday, which I will put on our website today. Working with inclusion framework, the targeting of AFAB and or autistic youth, intersectional work, intersectional work and funding. Um, so thank you all for, um, your um, your contributions to that. We will definitely um, take that into account uh, for future. And I do believe that TGU does a lot of intersec intersectional um, work. Um, so there are other people other than Gates, uh, our partners across the world who are, who are doing a lot of this work too. So um, so yeah, thank you for your participation in that, in that uh, short survey and I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Navon, and thank you everybody for answering our survey. It's really helpful. For us, it will guide us as we move to the next year to decide what kind of webinars or information or, or knowledge we need to prepare and share with our community. Thank you once more to Lizu, Alexis, Anonymous, and Dina. It was a pleasure listening to you. And, it's, and I want to thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for our viewers who joined us today. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you.